So let's dive into talking about storage, iSCSI, NFS, and virtualization. So getting performance out of this, there's a lot of factors involved. So I wanted to talk about a few of them because one of the first things people run into when they start doing things like setting up an NFS share, and generally NFS becomes a very popular and is not a bad way to go, but you right away run into some of these issues and questions and test configurations and diving deep into this. So we'll start with this article here. And by the way, I'm going to leave the link to all three of these articles. It's up to you if you want to read them before or after you watch this video, but they're going to have more depth on some of the really specific uh, details inside of here. And I may or may not cover some of these. I want to show you some of the practical side of the knowledge I gained from reading all of these articles. So we'll jump right to the summary. NFS by default will implement sync rights as requested by ESXi clients. Now you can insert ESXi, Prox, Mox, whatever your hypervisor is. In my case, it's going to be XCPNG, um, but Citrix, you could fit that one in there as well. It's the way the synchronized rights hap with happen with NFS. This is one of the reasons that iSCSI can appear faster. Well, it technically is faster, but this comes back down to that whole integrity versus speed and what is an acceptable amount of risk when it comes to your data. So the options are doing NFS with sync disabled. We're going to test that. Uh, some people use sync disabled and NFS to gain speed. This causes asynchronous rights your VM. And yes, it is lightning fast. However, in addition to turning off sync rights for the VM data, it turns off sync rights for the VZFS metadata. So this actually doesn't just affect the VMs, uh, as in the connection between the VM and where you're storing it. This also is turning off syncing for the ZFS metadata or the ZIL. So this may be hazard both your VMs and the integrity of that particular ZFS pool. So those are risks. And we're talking about catastrophic failure, like you know absolute power loss or uh, drives failing while data is in flight. iSCSI by default does not implement sync rights. As such, it often appears to be much faster and therefore a much better choice in NFS. However, your VM data is being written asynchronously which is hazardous to your VMs. On the other hand, ZFS file system pool metadata is being written synchronously, which is a good thing. So we're going to explore how that works in practice. This also means you probably know way to go if you refer to buy an SSD slog for your device and are okay with some risk to your VMs. So it is probably a good way to go, but you do require a slog device. Now, I'm not going to jump into the entire article of this, but this is the ZFS ZIL and SLOG demystified. It is not a cache. It is the ZFS intent log or SLOG is the way they call it. And while using a spinning hard disk for SLOG will yield performance benefits by reducing duplicate rates to the same disk, it is poor use of a hard drive given the small size but high frequency of the incoming data. And what they're saying is you really want to use SSDs for the SLOG or in bring this up to 2019 terms, because this is from uh, 2015, it's not just solid state, let's go all the way to say things like MVME. And of course, when you get into the higher end enterprise equipment, this goes even further. They make specialized devices that essentially operate more like uh, RAM speed in order to do this intent log. And this is where there's a lot of reading and writing going on to get the right synchronous. And this is very relevant because we're talking about how VMs sync. So how the data stored in a virtual machine is written there. This adds a lot of complexity. And because of the way a file system that has been virtualized and then running inside of VM changes, there's a ton of little writes going on. It's not like normal file writes where I'm just copying a file over to a server. I changed one file out of 10,000. The OS is handling it when you use a share, for example, on FreeNAS and ZFS. All right, so let's jump into the hardware setup and how this is actually uh, configured. First, this was the FreeNAS Mini XL Plus that is on loan from the folks at IAC Systems that we're using for demonstration. It is hooked up at 10 gig. The server is going to be this box here. So we'll go over here to hosts for folks wondering. This is a Dell PowerEdge R720 XD provided by the folks over at Tech Supply Direct. We have an offer code with them. If you want to check it out below, they get you 10% off purchases of servers, workstations, or anything you want to buy from their website. They have some excellent deals. We've bought servers from them. Um, and this one was uh, provided uh, kind of a sponsorship for the channel. Uh, so I really want to thank them. And if, like I said, if you want 10% off, uh, we have an affiliate link below. They get you 10% off any purchases on their server equipment. 
All right, let's jump into how this system is configured in more detail. So this FreeNAS Mini XL is connected via RJ45 at 10 gig. I have a whole review of this box and I'll leave a review link to it that shows how it works and all the little you know, hardware details of it. It's running an Intel Atom C3758 at 2.2 gigahertz. And these are all SSDs that we have for the disk in use. So everything we're gonna be doing is 100% test with SSD drives. They're just some SAN disk drives or 240s or nothing high performance or nothing really high end. They're consumer drives. Like CPNG, also connected at 10 gigs. So the storage is connected at 10 gigs. The ETH0 is connected at 10 gigs. We're actually running everything over just the ETH0, but it is a 10 gig connection. And I set it up here for a demonstration just so people know. No magic here. Uh, I'm not that good at editing to create. A bunch of lies. You just have to take my word for it. Yes, it talks at full 10 gigs, 9.41 gigs a second. No problems there. So that's all that. For those wondering how I'm splitting the screen, because that always comes up first, and you can see I've already been doing some testing here. Uh, we'll clear all this. This is Tmux, and I've just split a screen so I can have uh, each one of the VMs that I log into here. And up top, so we know what we're running here, this is load on the free NAS. And uh, we're going to this file right here, all we're doing is running zpool iostat-v uh, for SSD tank. That's the name of the tank on there. Update every one second. So that's just so we have some information rolling by so we can see these reads and writes happening. Go back over to here. And we have, and we'll go ahead and both of these are started up. So we'll go ahead and log into them. Like I said, I've already been running a lot of tests. We'll jump into all the details of the results and everything else here. So this one, the Debian Lab on NFS FreeNAS Mini XL Plus, uh, we'll log into that one here. And then we'll go over here, get the IP address of this one, which is uh, 158, and we'll log into that one here. Oops. Okay, both of these are logged in as ready. And to make things as clear as possible when I'm doing these demonstrations, this one says Debian FreeNAS Mini XL Plus NFS. This one says Debian FreeNAS Mini XL Plus iSCSI. And to show you the pools, the way the pools are set up. Here is the SCSI one set up as a ZVAL, so it's set up as block storage through iSCSI. Here is the uh, SSD test right here. This is set up as an NFS. So this one's iSCSI, this is the NSS test. I they labeled it SSD test and forgot to add it. I guess I could always edit the comments on there. Um, but it, you get the idea. This is the SCSI one. This is the NFS one. They're both running on the same disk pool. So we're eliminating all the different variables we're seeing directly because it's the same free NAS box. It's the same disk pool. Uh, we're seeing how this is all set up. Other details that are noteworthy. So we're going to go here and edit options. And like we had mentioned, we have sync disabled. This is the higher risk, but better performance when you're running an NFS share. Now with the iSCSI here, we're going to go ahead and, whoops, edit the ZVAL. It's standard sync. So uh, nothing special. That's just the default because by default with iSCSI, when you create a ZVAL, it's going to sync inherited based on the data set. The data set by default wants to sync. So that's all set to be normal as far as that goes. So that should give us the best performance in NFS, and that's where we're going to start. What kind of performance do we get out of this NFS system? So over here, what you're seeing at the top here is the four drives and I have a cache drive in here. I love the cache drive in because a lot of people think you can get a lot more performance when you're dealing with virtual machines out of a caching drive. This is not the same as a Zill, but the uh, read cache. And that's kind of limited because it's, it's better to put more memory in a system because it will pull read from the memory. This is one of the things that ZFS does really well is push. A lot of people think ZFS is memory hog, but it's actually pushing all the constantly read data into memory. So it does benefit in performance from having a lot of memory. But I went ahead and threw this in here and you can see how much it's being used. Even with these running, you can see these little writes happening here and there and it's just not caching them. But I'll leave it up there so you can see what's going on. First thing we're gonna do, and I'll show you of course how this works, speed test. We're just gonna create a file and delete it. I think that I created a two gig file. so. What kind of speed do we get out of this? 949 megs a second. So we'll run it again. 975. So you get pretty fast speed out of these four drives. Now this is RAID Z1, if you didn't notice up here. So 
in case you're wondering. And like I said, in those articles that I'm going to leave links to, there's breakdowns of the performance difference in Z1, Z2, et cetera, and uh, spreading the writes across more drives. So now we're going to run the speed test over on the iSCSI here. What kind of performance are we going to get out of this? 731, not bad. We'll run it again. You run them a few times and it's pushing the data right back to 787. So cool. Once again, cache had nothing to do with it. All it's doing is reading and writing a simple drive. We're going to get something more complicated here next. And we're going to run the Pharonix IO zone test. We're going to do, I will say, 64 kilobit. All right, so option two, option two for writing a two gig of data and one. And let's see what the right performance is on this. So you're going to watch this up here happen. So we were seeing all the drives spin up and all the writes occurring over here and it's running the tests. Let this test complete. All right, this was able to complete. It looks like it's uh, 694. All right, let's run the same test over here. Same options, option two, option two, write performance. And the reason we're doing write performance is because read performance gives you ridiculously big numbers because of the caching. So this tool doesn't do a good job of testing uh, read performance because it comes up with some really artificial numbers that are unrealistic for the actual speed of the drive. All right, now that completed. So we have 694 over here with NFS and we have 530 here with iSCSI. So you're probably thinking, oh, NFS all the way, definitely a much faster system, et cetera, et cetera. But there's more to the story. So the first part we're going to do is this was without integrity. This is like the high performance, but higher risk. And for my lab, I think this is perfectly fine set up for production. I don't accept that as an option because you, you know, occasionally things happen, even with a UPS, even with proper shutdowns, something could happen. You want the most integrity. So let's see what happens when we turn on ZFS syncing. So we're going over here and we'll go to this here and we're going to edit options. Sync always save. And you can do these without shutting down the VMs. This is perfectly fine. And let's just run, we don't even need to do much more than run the raw speed test. So we'll speed test here, have the number pulled up, 776, so run it here. Okay, this is where things slow down. It's going to take a while to even complete the speed test. This is, we went from, if you remember the original speed test before the right here, and we'll actually scroll back while we're waiting. So if we scroll all the way up to the top here, we're getting 975, 949, and you can see all the writes happening, but when you tell it to sync every change as it's occurring, we lose 90% of the speed without a slog device, even though we're running SSDs. So if you're wondering if SSDs still need a slog device, absolutely. So we're down to 106. So almost 90% of our speed is just gone. So it's uh, substantially, and I'm not going to bother running this test. It's going to be the same. It's going to be really, really poor performance. So right here is telling you that you really need the syncs turned on. So now what happens if we go and turn the syncing on? Um, and add a slog device. So we're going to do both here. So we already got syncing turned on. So now let's go ahead and once again, you don't need to shut down the VMs for this. Because the devices like slog and cache can be dynamically removed uh, or added to a pool, we can go here. We're going to go add the log device. And this is another SSD we have in here. So we're going to go ahead and fill this over here and extend. Confirm we're extending the pool. And watch what happens over here. This is going to refresh in a second. And it'll show up. There we go. Now, let's just run the same test. Now we have this slog device. Now a lot of people ask how big it needs to be. Um, this is way bigger than it needs to be, by the way. A really small drive because you're only putting as much data as it can accumulate over a short period of time. They detail that. There's a formula you can calculate, but they can be very, very small drives. And I'll demonstrate that here. Run the same speed test. And the only thing we did was add a slog drive. So here we actually see quite a bit of data being written to the slog drive. Now, like I said, these are all SSDs and this is not any faster than these. So we went from 106 to 426. Now let's run this test again to see what type of performance 
changes there are here. Whoops. So uh, we'll run it as a same here. So two, two, one. Now, the reason I'm running this test again is because it's not going to be as fast as it was. Once you turn on synchronization, even with this device here, there are still slowdowns. There are still performance issues that happen here. It's just not going to be quite as fast. But you have very high integrity because it's absolutely synchronizing and writing to the ZFS metadata every single minor change that happens to the system. So it's not that ZFS with NFS is bad, but if you want 100% top-notch integrity, this is the way to get it. But that does come still at the expense of not being quite as fast. So it's almost done running here, and we'll see what the results were. Eh, down to about 300 on this particular test. So that is a far cry from, if we scroll up here, the 694 that we had before. So you can see there's quite a bit of a difference, but that's still not the full story. Matter of fact, when we run this a couple times, it may even improve a little bit as it may expand the VM, but it, it's going to be, we'll run it one more time while we're waiting. So two, two, one, and see if it's a little bit better the second time, but probably not much. Sometimes you get small variations on there um, after you add something. I don't know if it's because it's caching or expanding the drive a little bit, but you'll see some small variations on it. But you can see the integrity comes at the expense of speed. But we're going to dive deeper into this because this is still just one thing happening at a time. The idea of an entire virtualization stack is so many things can happen at a time. And you actually notice we're using a little bit of the cache, like kilobits of uh, the cache drive here. So not much. That's one reason I left it in there. It's not going to, even with the iSCSI over here, it's not going to create a big performance difference. So this is running and let's see where we end up. Should be just about finished. There we go. Yeah, 292, pretty much the same as before. But here we are over at the iSCSI. And we run the same test again, two, two, one. And while that's running, I want to point out something else. So all this is fine, and we're running each one of these individually. So let's take a look, though, at the stats that we're getting from the storage devices. So storages, and we'll open up each one separately. There's the SCSI uh, on FreeNAS Mini XL Plus, and here's the NFS on there. We'll go to the stats page. So we see the pretty impressive IOPS that we're getting out of there. And if you're not familiar uh, with IOPS, this is an important number when it comes to determining virtual machine performance. It's not just about like raw performance of how fast can we transfer data back and forth. It's, you know, there's a lot of operations going on, especially with these sync operations, especially with a lot of VMs, ideally maybe 20, 30 VMs you have running on there, all doing things. You need IOPS as in how much kind of performance on there. Then we have the IO wait time, which is how long were we waiting for the IO? And then we have the latency here. So these are all the different factors. That's why these stats are here. And then here on the iSCSI one, we're seeing, uh, we just ran that test here. So we've seen about 450, 493 we ran the test before, but we only have a two millisecond latency and our IO wait time hit 23% versus over here we were hitting in the 31% and four millisecond. But we did see some bursting that was a lot faster. So that's gonna be some of the factors that play into it. Now, why am I bringing all this up? So let's go ahead and we're gonna do this side by side. So we're gonna start running the test and there we go this lined up to better. So now we have these two lined up. So now we can run this here and uh, let's push it quite a bit further. So we're still getting 520 out of here, but still 290. So it's not as much. But these are, of course, benchmarks, which sometimes don't always get things right. Uh, so I want to show some more real world here. One of the things you're going to see right away is when you start creating snapshots because snapshots, which we love, and this is the wonderful reason for running any of these. So we're gonna hit the NFS, we're gonna hit snapshot here, is you wanna be able to snapshot your VMs. This is one of the huge things before you make a change, like a snapshot, it can revert back to snapshots. It makes my backups easier and things like that. 
Snapshots come at a performance price. This is one of the reasons when you're doing storage planning and designing, I've never understood people who want to store everything inside the VM. For example, if you have a file server, don't store it all in a VM because if you want to create any snapshots, you're trying to keep differentials. And we have clients, you know, like with a few terabytes of data and thousands of little documents for course their enterprise. If you stored them all inside a VM, that would be very difficult because now you're snapshotting at this level and big performance penalty. At some point you want the file system to be directly attached to some other storage device for storage. As a talk for another day about uh, storage planning outside of here, we're going to focus on the VMs. But this differential that has to be created is we have to keep track of the changes between the current status of the operating system that's running in a VM and the difference between here. So I can at any given time, you know, revert this back to the snapshot. So what does that look like in terms of this? So if we run here, and we'll just actually do a speed test. Because the first time we run it, it's going to be even slower than the next time we run it. So we'll run it once here. And you'll start seeing we lost. We went from 400 down to 373. We run it again, it'll probably run a little bit faster because it's now created at least one delta uh, that's about that big between the two. Eh, about the same. And now let's run it over here. And we're still getting about the same speed. Now, why do we lose speed over here and over here? Well, this is the way you treat those deltas. The deltas are separate individual files that the underlying operating system is handling. So if we go here and uh, cd slash mount uh, lab. Here are the files we just created. And what these files are, are the delta differences. So we have the main VM and then we have the delta differences between those. And that is what's occurring here. So we wrote a two gig file, but it seems to that we have 3.3 gigs here. So it's telling you go create this other file, create this delta and create the separation between it. And any changes that occur in this, so we can always revert back to them, log those changes in there. And uh, it's, basically XCPNG or whatever your hypervisor is talking back to the system on the back end and create these files and put this transaction data here. So for any time you create transaction data in this, it has to then be replicated over here or the differential between it, the delta. Um, and this obviously comes at the price of performance because when you have a bunch of snapshots and we have to keep track of all the snapshots and then you compound this problem by having a whole lot of VMs running and a whole lot of snapshots. And you can see how this can add up really quickly. And then there's some management overhead that comes with all that. iSCSI is presented as a block device to the hypervisor. So XEPNG handles that by talking directly to it as if it's a hard drive attached to it. And then that's why we can't see it even from the command line when you look at block devices inside of FreeNAS. It just goes it's a block device, it's a ZVAL, we presented it as if it was a hard drive. So all those transactions occur by just talking to it as if it was a hard drive. So it's a different fundamental to the way iSCSI works, which means we lose less performance out of it. So when we're doing the speed test with or without those uh, snapshots, we still get reasonable performance. So let's look at the performances now since we uh, have this. So the last one before the snapshot was 292. What are we looking at with the snapshot? Two. Two, one, let that run. Actually, we'll put it at the top here. So uh, pull up the stats again. We see all the read writes happening, the Zill cache doing its thing. And once again, it's not just doing its thing for that one VHD file, it has two to keep track of. So we're at 291 and let's scroll back again. 292, scroll back a little further. Not too bad, we're keeping up pretty decent with it, but it's not near as what it was before. So here this, same thing, we got a snapshot. Look over here, two, two, one. See what kind of performance we get on the ice guzzy. Already right, completed, and interestingly, because it had one run that apparently was 376, maybe it was some leftover writes happening. 
Uh, so one time slow, but then the rest of the time consistent, we ended up with 508. So even with these snapshots, we didn't kill the performance over here. But for the hell of it, let's go create another snapshot. So there's more things to keep track of. So new snapshot again. And we'll do the same over here. Now let's look at this. I want to look at the performance real quick. So uh, here's the NFS one. Here's your IO speed, IOPS. We still get more speed out of here because of the way the transactions are working. So we actually still got better performance out of the ice because it was able to perform at uh, 11,000 IOPS versus only 7,000 over here. Let's go back. And uh, now that we created more snapshots, let's just do the raw speed test because it's faster. And like I said, there's always, I've commented many times, lies, damn lies, and benchmarks. Benchmarks are only so much you can do. But they at least give us an idea of the performance difference. And even with more snapshots, uh, we still don't lose over here because it's all handling it within the system uh, directly. Now, the other thing we're going to do is go ahead and purge out these snapshots. So purge that one. Purge this one. We'll purge out this. I'll also mention when you do the purging, or actually go here, CD slash amount. And let's see how fast this happens. Okay, it did purge them. Depending on the amount of IO activity, there is a time it takes to coalesce basically and do a cleanup of all those files that got created on there. Uh, so that's worth mentioning that when you do these, sometimes you have to wait a minute for the IO to settle down. So it takes time to coalesce. So the speed performance gets back to where it should be. Looks like those things may have coalesced fast enough. And you can look up uh, coalescence between them. Uh, it's not completely coalesced because it's still performing a little bit slower. And this one's performing well. Now, the last thing I want to test here to kind of show this, we're going to do four all options, five all options. Just go for right performance. We'll do the same thing over here. So four, five, one. So now both of these are just beating up the same pool of drives intensely fighting for resources. So. Let's see how that's being handled on the back end here. So we're going to look at this here and let this ramp up. So we're watching all the drives. We'll let this run for a second and see what kind of IOPS we get. Like I said, they're competing for resources on here. And we're going to go over here inside of FreeNAS and go to sharing, oh, not sharing, um, services. I'll start and stop this because if NetData is running, by the way, and you add and remove cache drives, sometimes it decides to not show them. So uh, doing this, there we go. We can see that the disk write is being pushed pretty hard. The CPU is being pushed pretty hard, but not 100%. It's not completely used. As a matter of fact, I, I'll, I'll comment as well. FreeNAS is very responsive despite all this disk writing going on. ZFS system, so you can see what's going on here. There's a little gap where I just turned it on and off. So make sure I had all the drives in here. So we can see the demand, prefetch, metadata, read and write performance going on right here. Not much reading, but a whole lot of writing. Efficiency. And this is a data demand efficiency. We're gonna see this red right here because this is where it's just, you know, actually writing and exhausting caches and uh, getting information where it needs to be. So go back up here to the system overview. And let's look at these now. So competing, we're back up to a uh, better performance over here on the iSCSI side. So we're seeing 496 peak with 11,000 on the IOPS versus uh, 275 peak and 6,000 on the IOPS. And our IO wait time, two milliseconds of latency here four milliseconds latency here. IO weight is around 22%. IO weight just 20. So really close. I mean, I'm seeing some peak here. Look, we got 29% on there. So pretty reasonable, but you're still seeing that ice because he edging it out. Now I'll 
come back to the article one more time as I, won't, I do want to mention something here. Just to reiterate, as I said at the beginning, iSCSI by default does not implement sync rights. As such, it often appears to users much faster, therefore much better choice in NFS. However, your VM data is being written async. So the VM data itself is being written async, but the integrity of ZFS behind here is in sync. So potentially, because, and this actually is true of really any time you're dealing with block level device being presented to another operating system from another operating system, which is what iSCSI is doing, is presenting the ZVAL as a hard drive to whatever you're going to save it on, there is an inherent risk because you're taking and changing blocks on the hard drive. But just like if you unplugged a hard drive mid-session, there is the potential for corruption in there. And then one risk that you may face is if that corruption uh, corrupts the entire ZVAL, all the VMs within that ZVAL, well, they could have a problem. And uh, this is one of the reasons backup is so critical, why having a UPS and proper shutdown management so you don't have sudden power loss is critical. So there is that potential for it. Yes, there's some checking that goes on, but think about this just in perspective of if you unplug a SATA cable to a hard drive that's doing an internal uh, write process that's you know, scattering on the files, or let's say something like a defrag or coalescence that may occur with VMs. These are things that are happening all the time, especially in a busy uh, VM environment. So there is an inherent risk of data corruption, really with any system, your right array going bad and writing things bad. Uh, so this is just something to think about, reasons you should have snapshots for any of these. And uh, it's one of the things that iSCSI is really good on performance, um, but because you're not writing solid individual block files, uh, it's all one block presented to the operating system, there is always the chance for corruption in a catastrophic failure versus, well, any VA, uh, VHD files that are saved to the hard drive in a case of using NFS, those VHD files are all individual files. So it may not corrupt all the VMs, it may corrupt the one that was doing the writing, but other ones, and especially any of them that are turned off, there's no risk of corruption in those because, well, they're not doing anything, they're off. So there's not active writing going on. So this throwing the options out there uh, for a lab environment, I think NFS, and this is actually what we use and why so much for our NFS, our lab environment is NFS with sync turned off. I find it to be an acceptable risk and I get the absolute best performance out of it. Um, but as always, backup, backup, backup. I backup everything. Uh, anytime I think there's gonna be a significant change, even to our lab environment, we have this dedicated just to do all these different Delta backups for lab. That way they can be backed up very, very fast. And anytime I make any large updates or changes to them, that way in case there was ever some catastrophic failure, no big deal. Not to mention your lab machines I use for YouTube demos or uh, testing a theory I have or something that a client may want set up that are not mission critical and they can be reloaded. I back them up more just for the convenience of not having to reload them uh, as I do things. But like I said, these are some of the options out there. Those articles will let you dive deeper into uh, ZFS. And for those you really wanted to dive into performance, I do, I've mentioned this article many times. This is such a good article to all the different write performances and read performances of all the different RAID options in ZFS and what they mean. And it's a good dive into it if you wanna really uh, get a grasp on how all that works. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general. Even suggestions for new videos, they're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.